Hi guys, welcome to Watch Hobbyist channel. So today I've got for you the Amiga Speedy Tuesday. Uh, this is a Speedmaster release like no other. It was the first one to ever be released online by Amiga and a really interesting watch. The story basically goes that a guy called Robert Jan Broer, uh, he's the founder of the Fratello Watches blog, apparently a really decent guy, and he certainly goes well in my books with what he's created here. He basically created a hashtag uh, five years ago, January, I think it was, 2012, um, and to commemorate five years of this hashtag of Speedy Tuesday on places like Instagram and what have you and on his blog, um, you ended up with this watch. Now, okay, it's a bit of a tenuous link, um, a bit of a crazy thing to create a commemorative model of. Um, if you think about it, if you break it down, you know, what, what does this actually signify? But in, if you look at it closely, what it signifies is the movement of watches these days, the, the movement of people loving watches. We, we, we're all in the same sort of scenario here. If you're watching this video, you're probably interested in watches in some way. And this is our time, you know, it's a golden era of watches. There's never been such a great time for so many different models. And the Speedmaster in its own right is a really, really interesting watch. It's been around for many, many years in many, many different guises. But this is a watch for enthusiasts. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't loads of speculators. Of course, there were people that at the end of the day, you didn't have to put a deposit down. That's where Amiga went wrong, in my opinion, but you didn't have to pay any deposit. You just literally put your name down. And if you got selected, you could choose your number, you could order the watch, and then it came when it came. And if you wanted to keep it fine, and if you went to sell it, well, what can they do about it? So look, that's your choice. If that's what you did, then fine, whatever. I'm not gonna have a go at anybody about that. What I am, thinking though is that this watch for me was really intended for enthusiasts it was created by an enthusiast and really a much better job you could not have done um, this for me is probably well it's up there in my top three favorite speedmasters if not my favorite speedmaster that i've personally ever owned up until this point my favorite speedmaster was a close tie between the 60th, which you've probably just seen in a recent review, although this might come out before that, um, or there was one for the 45th anniversary of Apollo 11, and that was a titanium and Sedna gold bundle with a chocolate dial. That's one of my favorite watches. I stupidly had one and sold it like an idiot, and now they go for silly money, and I wish I could get another one, um, but it's probably just not gonna happen. But this is now my current favorite Speedmaster, I would say, along with the 60th. Um, very different watch is this in the 60th. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about the 60th model, but what I would say to you is that the 60th is um, shiny in its way. It's, it's got like a polished case. All this is about is matte finishing. And for that reason, it feels like a watch that just it just feels like a watch that will never age in any way it feels like a watch that could be worn to any occasion any event any scenario whether you're on the top of everest or at a dinner you know it's that kind of watch that's just very very versatile and that's what i like about it so much so yes it's a bit of a crazy thing to commemorate i have seen some people moan about it but that's my opinion on it uh, before i get into showing you about the packaging and the watch itself um, i think it's a great iteration of the speedmaster professional um, it still kept the the main features that I like so I'm just going to quickly talk about uh, the sort of packaging which is what I normally do first before I get into the watch I know that annoys some people but it's just the way I like to do it and I think it sort of shows you the the, the background to the watch a bit better so you can see here I've got the watch on a strap that's actually the Amiga Bond NATO strap. Uh, this was on the Spectre that I used to own. I no longer own that. Um, but forget that because that's not what comes with the watch. So that's just what I've got it on. Okay. It actually comes with all this here. Okay. So we have, first of all, the usual instruction manual. Okay. Um, then there's this little booklet, which I'll show you in a second. There's this watch roll, which contains some things inside it. And also on the back, it has these little slots to be able to um, sort of put your cards in, your, your warranty card and your pictogram card. 
so the pictogram card basically tells you what functionality the watch has. Um, the watch came to me in this little coffin case and inside there is the original brown leather strap which I'll also talk about shortly. Okay, so that's that. And then you also get uh, this NATO strap which is obviously very similar to the strap that I've got but um, I, I don't know, I haven't sort of gelled with the white one. I've not actually tried it but I've not gelled with it either so I put it on the grey one because I felt it, it just made the contrast of the dial look a bit stronger. Um, whereas if I put that on it, then I don't know, I think it somehow blends the subdials a bit, so I didn't bother with that too much. But I still like it, it's just uh, I prefer what I've got it on. So, anyway, uh, back to it. So, first thing that's really nice is this little booklet. With any limited edition Amiga, you do tend to get some kind of special booklet, a certificate of authenticity, but also something that uh, basically tells you about the watch. Um, on the back of here, so inside you get all the information but on the back of it you also get sort of like the limited edition number inside you get like i say the info on the watch so we've got the caliber which is an 1861 it's 50 meters water resistant it's a 14 millimeter height to the watch and a 42 millimeter diameter uh, all that sort of thing basically uh, the dial the color is black with uh, white opaline silvery subdials, as it's described there um, and that's an important feature because it's, as far as I know, the first ever Speedmaster with a reverse panda dial. So reverse panda, for those that don't know, is basically a panda dial is classed as a white dial with black subdials usually. Um, in this case, it's a black dial with white or silvery, or opaline is what it's called, uh, subdials, and basically therefore a reverse panda. And for me, I think it works really, really well. I've heard some people say that the contrast of the dial um, isn't so easy in certain lights but I've not struggled with it. Back onto the packaging we've got this really incredible leather watch roll. Now why I say incredible is because um, I'm a fan of jackets and belts and accessories and things like that in my daily wear and I like things like that to be leather sometimes and it's very rare you will come across a leather that's as soft and as supple and as good quality as this. So it's something that's really been thought about. It's not something that was a two second decision to choose this. Um, this has really been looked at properly. Um, the nice thing about the watch roll is that you also get the Amiga Speedmaster logo embossed into it. Okay, and then if we open upwards, obviously you would normally get uh, the, the strap, the uh, NATO in there. I just pulled it out before I did the review. Um, so you'd have a strap section there for your NATO, a strap section for your brown strap if you've removed it or whatever. Um, you've got a little tool here which it has Amiga on it. It's a spring bar removal tool so you can actually remove the uh, change straps with it basically. But also in the bottom of it if you unscrew this cap at the bottom there's some little spring bars and things like that which actually some people may not even know that they're in there but it's uh, it does unscrew at the bottom so that's quite a little cool cool little thing um, that lives in its own little pocket inside the watch roll uh, so again a nice thing and then we also have this uh, which I'm not going to remove but we have this here which is the uh, watch cloth and I don't know if you can see it but it just says hashtag speedy Tuesday embossed into it there as well and um, so that's got its own little compartment um, I don't think there's actually a compartment for the watch itself, unlike the 60th, which does have that, but maybe you could fit the watch into there, so maybe that's what that area is for. Um, but, you know, I don't know whether people actually use these for their intended purpose or whatever, but it's, um, it's still, it's a, it's a nice part of the packaging. And especially when you're paying so much money for a watch, it's nice to get these little things. Um, it then closes together with a sort of loop system. So you just do that. Now what's really really cool is that we have here the original brown leather strap. Now to me, I've seen people moaning about the quality of this strap. I think this is a great quality strap, really really nice quality leather. Uh, and it's like a soft leather on the outer so the brown bit will wear really nicely. But on the inside it's like a, a very textured leather I think. I don't think it's rubber or anything, I think it's like a really textured solid leather. Um, so that's going to help with the overall wear and tear ability of the strap over its lifetime. Um, but they've just got nice little touches like if you look at it, it's not quite the same colour. So maybe that suggests that it, during, during the design process uh, the colour of the strap was changed or something like that. Um, but they have got the details going on. 
So the end of the little locker flap type thing on the, uh, on the watch roll matches the end of the strap. You know, just details like that that really, really stand out. Um, you've also got the stitch sort of motif type thing there, um, which I guess matches with the strap again. So a lot of attention to detail with this watch. And I think that's where it's gone wrong is because you can't actually get your hands on one of these watches. You're looking at pictures and you're not seeing the full details going on, but I have not seen an Amiga with this much, this much attention to detail um, other than the 60th really. They're the two that probably have the most attention to detail of any Amigas I've ever seen. Um, even down to like the buckle here is brushed to match the case of the watch because that's all brushed as well, um, which is what gives its appeal to me, which I didn't think it would, but it actually has turned out to be one of the nicest features. So, you know what I mean? Overall, this, this watch, yes, it's had a, a load of controversy about it because of the type of watch it is and, and because of the way people bought it and because of what it commemorates and everything like that. But if we forget all that, if we forget it's a limited edition, and just look at it as a watch and a package in itself, for me, this is just one of the most fantastic Amigas that has ever come to production. I really, really do rate it, as you can hopefully tell. I'm really, really sort of, you know, psyched about this one. Um, I'm just gonna, before I show you the, the actual watch itself, I'm just gonna show you the, the actual lug to lug. So I always do this because I find that, you know, I prefer the, uh, I prefer to know the size of the length of the watch which in this case is actually about 48 millimeters. Um, I prefer to know that size than the actual diameter. So that's, if you look at it, the same length as the 60th uh, anniversary model, more or less, that I have reviewed as well. And that's a 38.6 millimeter, I think, diameter. This is a 42 millimeter diameter, meaning that really both, because they're the same length, they both wear very, very similarly. Um, it's just that because I've got it on this strap, it's actually gonna look a lot bigger in a minute when I put it on my wrist. Um, so for me, this watch, you know, it, obviously it's a Speedmaster Professional. It's got the same case size as the standard model that you can go to pretty much any, any Amiga store and buy. But um, now we're gonna go into the details of why this is different. So we've already looked at this being a reverse panda dial, um, which is very, very interesting because I've never seen it before. I don't believe it's ever been done before. But the inspiration for this watch was actually the Alaska 3 model. Now, the Alaska 3, I'll be honest with you, before I, uh, before I heard about this watch, I hadn't really sort of looked at the Alaska 3. I have been to the museum. I think it's the most amazing thing to go to but I've never really taken notice because there's so many different watches there. there. There must be hundreds and hundreds of very rare, very um, sort of high-end uh, Speedmasters in the hierarchy of, of the Speedmaster range, you know, the ones that have been to space and all sorts of different things. The one that was given to President Nixon but had to be uh, returned because the President couldn't receive a gold watch. Just things like that. There's so many watches in there that, that have huge precedents in the world of the Speedmaster that you could never actually particularly pick out one. So Robert Jan Brower going to the museum probably to do his research and find an Alaska 3 to become the one that inspired this watch, that's no easy task at all because there's so many watches that he could have chosen as the basis for this. So obviously he's picked that for, for his reasons, but he's picked a really good one. Um, first of all, the Alaska 3 has a brushed case just like this one. So instead of any polished areas, like normally you'd have the sort of polished chamfered edges on the top of the uh, lugs here. Sorry, my camera isn't focusing very well. Um, but this, in this case, is all brushed. So a satin finish to the entire watch case. But still, it has enough shine that it looks good in, in most occasions, but um, there's no polish going on there. So most people worry about like little scratches and stuff. You have to worry about those less with a brushed case. That's a good thing. But also it just gives a totally different look. A bit like seeing a, um, you know, a Range Rover and you see some that have just come straight out of the factory all shiny and polished. But then you see other people that have had them matte wrapped. Um, it's that kind of different aesthetic. So it just takes the shine away from it and gives it a totally different purposeful look. Um, you know, which really works well for me. I mean, even the bit between the sort of case and the bezel, that's not shiny. Nothing is shiny on this watch. It's all about a matte finish. Um, that carries through to the, the sub dials as well, where they're like a, 
sort of satin finish to them. If you look at them, there's no shine really going on there. They don't reflect back too much, even under bright sunlight or whatever. I'm not sure if you can see as well, hopefully you can, but the subdial at six o'clock on the Speedy Tuesday is the same as the Alaska 3 because it has one to 12 going around that subdial versus 36912, so that's another nice feature. Um, and the greatest thing about this watch is the loom, but I'm gonna leave that for a little while and show you shortly. Back to the case, we do have the brushed uh, pushers and the brushed crown. Now I have noticed occasionally that when I go to pull the crown on this particular model, it does feel a little bit tougher than uh, than others that I've had. I've had to really sort of dig my nail in there to, to pull the crown out. I don't know if that's because when it's polished maybe on the standard model, it removes some of the metal and there's maybe a little bit more tolerance, I've no idea. Um, but I have noticed it does feel a little bit harder to pull the crown, but actually, now I'm used to it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just the first time I went to do it. I was thinking, you know, I've, I've got to put my finger in, uh, fingernail more into it than I would expect to, that's all. Um, pushers do what they say on the tin, so you start the chronograph, stop the chronograph and all that, reset. The crown on the professional is always easy to wind um, and there's no difference with that, certainly in this case. So every day when you go to wind the watch to wear it, um, you're gonna have no issues there. It's nice and grippy and it just gives you that stop at the end when you know you sort of shouldn't push it anymore. So always wind a watch like this relatively gently. Don't do it really forcefully because you could break the mechanism inside. But as long as you just sort of give it a normal sort of pressure to actually wind it, then that's all that really needs to, to kickstart the movement into life. Um, thickness is exactly the same as we said, 14 millimeters to the standard professional model. Now in this case, I've got the watch on an ATO strap and it's an Amiga NATO, which means something. What that means is that these straps are not your average sort of $3 NATO from Amazon or whatever. They're very, very thick. They're made of, I think, polyamide. Um, they're a different level above any other NATO. Now it's not to say that you can't get NATO straps for much less money that are exactly the same, um, you know, build and quality because they're probably made in the same factory. But as this is a NATO strap from Amiga, it does add quite a lot of thickness. And where it adds the thickness the most is here. And it's gonna be no different with the actual strap that comes with the watch, the white and black one. Um, so on my wrist, I have quite a small wrist. And of course, it does actually make the strap sort of stick quite far out on my wrist. But I've actually got used to that. I don't mind it. I'm sure some people say it looks too big or whatever, but I actually don't mind it at all. I think it looks really, really good. Especially as we're in winter at the moment and when I wear this watch with a coat or whatever, it's gonna protrude from the, the sleeve uh, and make it so I can see the time really easily. Um, so it's not gonna fall under the cuff, uh, which is a really good thing. So it's, uh, you know, for me, I think the NATO works really, really well, but back to the dial. Now, the thing I've not mentioned properly yet is the loom, okay? So the loom is like no other, and I'm gonna show you it now. And there we go, there's the luminescence of the Speedy Tuesday. And this for me is the most fun part of its whole character. So not only do you have the normal hands and the batons loomed, but you have the subdials loomed. And then not only do you have the subdials loomed, but if you look at the Amiga text at the top of the dial, Amiga Speedmaster Professional, that's loomed as well. Every single thing, including the Swiss made at the bottom, is has got loom to it. And basically, it's amazing. Now, does it glow like that all night? No, absolutely not. But it does last as long as your average Speedmaster Professional. Um, so it sort of dies off relatively quickly to a sort of level that um, is usable and readable uh, for most of the night. I do notice that the subdials die off a bit quicker than the actual batons and hands. So maybe the loom used on those subdials is, um, you know, it's a little bit of a different type or whatever, but when it is lit at night, it's still usable and you can actually time in a dark situation with it, no problem, because it allows the hands on the subdials to actually stand out. So if you're in pitch black and you've got some loom going on with the subdials, you can actually time it, um, uh, time things on the chronograph with it. And I think that's really, really good because it's basically given even more functionality to an already great watch. 
So for me, like the Speedmaster is one of the best watches for visibility and readability anyway. Uh, always has been. Some people say it isn't, but for me personally, I think the contrast going on with any Speedmaster Professional is usually great. This one even more so because it's got that extra functionality in the dark if you need it as well. Um, so although it could be seen as a gimmick, it could actually be usable as a, you know, as a function for some other people. So that's the Loom. Um, you know, for me, this watch really is, yes, it's a limited edition that created a lot of hype. Yes, it's a watch that has a bit of a sort of contentious type of link to its, its um, you know, its limited edition run and, and the purpose for that. But at the same time, I think this is definitely one of the greatest Speedmasters of all time. Is there anything I would change on it? Um, for me, personally, not really. Some people complain about the 1861 movement. I think it's a great movement. I like how you interact with it every single day when you're gonna wind it. I don't think it needs to be improved particularly. It's a 50 meter water resistant watch. Would I like more water resistance? Well, maybe, but if that was gonna make it thicker, then definitely not. 50 meters for me is probably fine. And I have been swimming with Speedmasters in the past and never had an issue. So I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying you should do. I don't know what Amiga actually say on that, but for me, 30 meters is pushing it, but 50 meters and above, I'm usually quite happy to sort of risk uh, going swimming with it because I like a watch to work for me, um, you know, and work well for me if I'm gonna spend all that money. But speaking of money, the actual price point of this watch, it's 4,100 pounds here in the UK. The standard Speedmaster Professional is, I think it's 3540 at the minute or 3520 in that sort of range. So you're paying around about a five or 600 pound premium. Yeah. The other quick thing I'd like to mention is that you've seen the packaging and look how small it is. And Amiga could really take note themselves about this because the standard speedy model that comes with a, a massive box to me is totally unnecessary and a bit, a bit over the top. Whereas this nice small box fits in one of my cupboards dead easily. So I hope you've enjoyed my little look at the Amiga Speedy Tuesday. At retail price, this is a great buy. At a premium price, I do think that it's one watch I could say is worth it. I'm not just saying that. I honestly think it. At the end of the day, if you couldn't get your hands on one at a retail price originally, it's a shame to miss out. And if you're such a Speedmaster fan that you think this would make a great part of your collection, then it's unfortunate you do have to pay more for it on the secondary market, but there's not many watches that I would recommend are worth more. And also for the prices that they're going above their price, you know, it's not it's not like the Daytona where it goes from 8,000 to 15,000 pounds. You know, this is uh, a watch that the prices have stayed currently quite reasonable on the secondary market, but I guess will keep creeping up. So if you are gonna buy one, you probably need to get one sooner rather than later. Um, it is now known that the last batches have pretty much all been delivered. So it's unlikely that too many more are actually gonna come into the dealer network, which might be something you want to uh, sort of take into account. So thanks again for watching. Please make sure you give this uh, video a thumbs up if you liked it. And please make sure you subscribe to the Watch Hobbyist channel. And you can also follow me on Instagram at Watch Hobbyist, where you'll see all my watches that I've bought recently, if I've bought any, or just pictures of the watches that I own just generally out and about. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon.